Thank you. Um, Thank you. So the, the title that we have here is Tipping uh, Room and Fermentation to Maximize Milk Fat. And I really uh, find milk fat and milk fat depression interesting because it has to do with the complexity in the rumen. So you have thousands of rumen microbes. You have all of these changes in, in intake, timing of intake, uh, differences that, uh, in the dynamics in the rumen, and all of this complexity that comes into determining how much milk fat a cow actually makes. Really, really interesting stuff, and I call it job security because it's so complex, right? But it is nothing, it is nothing compared to the complexity of billions of neurons and the dynamics of human behavior. So, so it's really quite simple, so we should be able to figure this out, right? Uh, so I'm really excited to be back. It was uh, here last year and, and showed a little a bit of our data that we're starting to do with Novus. I'm going to show some of that again. We've continued to work with Novus, working with Alamet. Uh, but then we have some new things that I wanted to bring up. And we're going to skip around a little bit. So just to warn you, a couple times I'm going to say, OK, now we're going to change topics and, and talk about something else. One thing that I didn't hear Jennifer talk about this morning is attention spans. And in, act in academia, we tend to have very short attention spans. So, so hopefully that's not too distracting today. We're going to really be talking about milk fat the entire time, but we're going to move around in a few subjects around milk fat. So I always like to start out recognizing that there's a lot of things that impact milk fat. In, in my view of the world, there's nutritional factors and non-nutritional factors. And we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about this diet-induced milk fat depression, which we all know a lot about from experience, but also from all of the research that's been done. It's been investigated for over 150 years. The last 15 years, we really learned a lot about it after Dale Bauman made some key, key insights. So this milk fat depression is when we get a specific reduction in milk fat, no change in milk protein, no change in milk yield. Really a neat situation where you're just decreasing one set of metabolic pathways in the mammary gland. The other things that are going on, we have genetic effects. And you know, I'm not a geneticist, but with the current inbreeding coefficient of the US dairy herd, I have a hard time believing that one guy's herd is only capable of a 3-3 and another guy's herd is capable of a 4-0, right? Yes, there's differences. There's some SNPs. There's some QTLs. They explain small differences. DGAT1 explains, what, about 0.2 percentage units. Yes, there's some genetic differences. It does not explain the big differences that we see farm to farm or within that farm. Stage lactation, those early lactation cows are dumping NEFA into milk. That's good for them because then their liver doesn't have to metabolize it. We have a season effect, and I, I'm not going to show any of that data today, but it's really important to keep that season effect in mind. Highest milk fat in January 1, lowest milk fat July 1. You have about a 0.25 percentage unit difference. I'd really like to know how to manipulate that, how to use that to our advantage, but we don't really know yet, or at least I don't know yet. Uh, it's really hard system to, to, to regulate. But it's important for setting goals on the farm you're not going to have as high of milk fat right now as you will in December. And that's why we, we usually say, you know, nutritionists or rock stars call, come January and February because milk components are high. You've made all of your adjustments going into your crops. Things are stabilized, right? The summer, you get heat stress. You get these seasonal effects. Things get a lot more difficult to get maximal components. Uh, parity has some effect, ambient temperature and heat stress changes all sorts of things related to feeding behavior and animal metabolism that, that have some very, very big effects. We're going to talk about a few of these sort of non-nutritional factors as, to, as they relate to nutritional factors. Um, so I always like to step back and say, remember, we're talking about the cow, and that cow is eating feed. We're trying to balance the right diet for her. For her and she's making milk. Pretty simple system, right? But then we have this darn rumen that gets in the way. And the rumen is great because it's converting all of this low quality feed to energy 
and high quality microbial protein. But it's also creating a lot of complexity. And although there's not a lot of unsaturated fat in these diets, the microbes are metabolizing that unsaturated fat. Two reasons. One, unsaturated fatty acids are toxic to microbes. They actually, they actually act like, sort of like a soap and disrupt some cellular membranes. But the other reason is that microbes do need fat to make their membranes. To, to keep the growing dividing, they have to make a lot of membranes. They don't like unsaturated fatty acids for the membranes. They want saturated fatty acids and trans fatty acids. The melting temp is what they need, okay? So, so if they can saturate these unsaturated fatty acids, they can use them to meet some of their demands for growing, uh, making their, their phospholipids. I think you guys probably have all seen this, bio, this uh, chemistry a few times. Uh, and I, I always like to warn people, we don't need to know all of these steps. But we need to appreciate that this process of biohydrogenation is not a single step. We don't simply go from the unsaturated fat that's in the feed to a saturated fat product. We have these intermediates that, of course, our organic chemistry professor made us memorize. He tortured us, or they tortured us for a while, right? But on this normal pathway, we make cis-9 trans-11, trans-11, and then steric acid. So we can go all the way to the final product, but sometimes this pathway is not highly efficient and we'll get build up these intermediates that wash out of the rumen and are absorbed by the cow. So under this, this normal pathway, we have normal milk fat. But then what happens is that if we have low pH or something that alters rumen fermentation, we get a change in the microbial population and that change in the microbial population results in microbes that don't use the normal pathway. They do things a little bit different. And they make some different CLA isomers. Trans-10, cis-12 CLA is one of them. And then they make trans-10, 18-1. And then if the process goes to completion, you get steric acid. But the problem is this pathway is not nearly as efficient as the normal pathway. We get rumen outflow of a lot of these intermediates. And Lance Bumgard, when he was doing his PhD with Dale Bauman, demonstrated that trans-10 cis-12 CLA decreases milk fat and the normal isomer does not. So I think you guys all know that story, but we sort of need to start out with that. So, of course, you're not feeding trans-10 cis-12 CLA, but there's these risk factors in the diet that are causing this shift to the alternate fermentation pathway. And there's a lot of things that can go into this. Basically, anything that can disrupt fermentation could lead to this problem. So this is my grocery list of, of things, right? And it, it could get longer. Anything that disrupts fermentation, anything that does not result in happy microbes, growing uh, at, at a, uh, of growing efficiently. At the top is this dietary fatty acid level and profile, the rueful concept that Tom Jenkins has is really good. Uh, but I think that 18.2 is more important. So look at rueful, but I also like looking at 18.2. The availability of the fatty acid is also really important. And uh, I, we, we're getting some more data that really demonstrates that the rate of the release of the fatty acid in the rumen is one of the major impacts on what's, what the effect of that fatty acid is going to be in the rumen. So if you think about feeding whole cottonseed, it has about the same fatty acid profile as whole soybeans, right? Uh, but that whole cottonseed very infrequently causes problems with milk fat depression because that oil is within a really hard seed coat. It's biohydrogenated, but it's biohydrogenated very slowly. Now, if you have whole soybeans that were ground finely or distiller grains would be the more extreme example where you basically have oil dumped back on top of the grain, that fatty acid in distiller grains is almost immediately available in the rumen. Okay? So if you think about the effectiveness of that oil or what oil is available to the microbes at any one second, that oil in, in distiller grains is much worse than the oil in cottonseed. I think we're really good about thinking about that related to starch, right? High moisture corn versus dry ground corn. Is there a difference in how those feeds feed? You bet, right? Well, what about the fatty acid release rate from those two different sources? Do you think that's different? It, it, it has to be, right? So rumen modifiers, ionophores are a risk factor, carbohydrate profile, rate and extent of fermentation, anything that's going to change diet fermentability. 
really complex discussion there, but anything that changes the diet fermentability. Effective fiber, two things there. You both have the chewing effect, but you also have the rumen passage effect. Ruminal nitrogen balance is something that there's not a lot of work done on. There's a little bit of work in the 80s, but to me, when you start limiting nitrogen to the rumen, you're going to slow microbial growth. You're not going to have as many microbes, right? That has to have an impact on the capacity of the microbes to biohydrogenate. This really starts worrying me when we start feeding very low crude protein diets, especially diets that are low in RDP. Feeding strategies and management, we're going to show a little bit about today. Yes, we feed a TMR, and theoretically every bite is the same, but we have huge differences in the rate of intake over the day, and that has a big impact on the rumen. Forage types, uh, individual calfax, level of intake, in, which is really related to level of production, has a, a big role, and I'm going to spend some time showing you some of that data today. So those are the risk factors. In, you look at the risk factors and you say, okay, we know what the risk factors are. Why can't we just eliminate them? Well, obviously we can't because of those, those are the same things that are getting us milk yield, they're getting us efficiency, right? So this is job security for myself as someone interested in doing research on milk fat because we are always going to have trouble with milk fat as long as we're trying to get high milk yield and have high efficiency, right? we are always going to be running up against this line of putting ourselves at risk. We can manage that risk, but we're never going to eliminate it. And we don't want to eliminate it. So how I view this is that we have this continuum from very high milk fat to very low milk fat, and every cow within a herd is somewhere along this continuum, and every herd is somewhere along this continuum. And we can actually see this in the transisomer profile in milk. So when we have very high milk fat, what happens is we actually have a very efficient biohydrogenation pathway. We have very few trans intermediates because they're going to completion. The first thing that happens is that we start slowing down the normal pathway and we'll get a buildup of these, this, the normal trans intermediate. And then we start shifting from the normal trans intermediate to the alternate trans intermediate, and then we get to very low milk fat. So at some point, we'll have this alternate pathway be the predominant pathway, and now we're at very low milk fat. So what's very high and very low? Well, you can pick your numbers, right? But maybe this is something of genetic potential, whatever you want to argue that to be, a four something, right? And very low milk fat, those cows are getting down to 2% or a little bit under. So something that I've always sort of struggled with and thought was a very interesting question is what cow are we actually balancing our diets for? So you go out on this herd and you walk the herd and take your feed samples. Now you return back to your office and you say, I'm balancing the perfect diet to the third decimal place and this is going to work perfectly. The model says so. Okay, let's go feed it. Now let's go back and pick out the cow we balanced for. Okay, so where is that 85 pound cow that's 180 days in milk, a 3.5 milk fat and a 3.1 milk protein? Where is she? Which cow is she in the herd, right? Now look at all those other cows in the herd and did I balance the diet for them? Not quite, right? She's pretty good at taking care of herself though and the rumen is pretty adaptable, the cow is pretty adaptable. That's something I've always been pretty amazed about. But I, we've really had a lot of interest in what's this variation within the herd and uh, what's the interaction with milk fat. So I know you guys appreciate the variation more than I do. You've probably seen more, I, well I, I would say I know you've seen more of this herd data because you're working with a lot more herds than I work with as a research scientist. But just wanted to show you some of the data so we're all on the same page. This is Milk fat ranked from the lowest to the highest in a 200 cow pen. Uh, they're averaging like a 3-2, but you have these cows below 2. You have a lot of cows below 3, about a bunch of cows between 3 and 4, and then some cows above 4%, all eating the same diet in the same pen. What's explaining this variation? Well, maybe some of these cows up here are early lactation cows. That would be my guess. But 
what about these cows down here versus these cows up there? Is it genetic potential? I have a hard time believing it's genetic potential, but again, I'm not, I'm not a geneticist. Another example of this, so a 900 cow herd with uh, uh, what I call moderate milk fat depression. The distribution here, a uh, nice, pretty normal distribution, but broad distribution. And what's interesting is when we split this by production level, overall mean was a 3.24. Cows below 75 pounds of milk is 3.8, 75 to 95 is a 3.2, but above 95 pounds of milk was a 2.9. Is that does there look like a relationship with production level there? Yeah, it looks like a real relationship. So I went and I plotted milk yield by milk fat percent. And there's a good bit of scatter around this graph, right? There's a lot of things other than production level that are explaining this. And you know, I'm, my guess is there's a lot of behavior aspects, other physiological aspects are explaining this variation. But there is a really significant fit to milk yield explaining a reasonable amount of the variation. And what I want to point out is the magnitude of the slope. That down here at the 60 pound cow, we're up near a four versus the 120 pound cow, we're down to about a 2.8, okay? So again, milk yield is not explaining everything, but explaining a reasonable amount of the variation. This is the basis for one of my recommendations when people say, I have lower milk fat. I like saying, which cows? Is it all the cows? Is it a certain pen of cows? Is it the high producing cows? Is it the low producing cows? Okay. I think it's really interesting to go in and look at the data, especially when someone has, say, a 3-4. And they say, OK, is that as good as I can get? Or do I have some sort of milk fat depression going on? I like to go in and sort out those cows that are, say, beyond 80 days in milk. So, you know, should be positive energy balance, lower NEFAs, and, say, above 90 pounds of milk, and look at them. And I think they're going to be sort of the canaries in the coal mine to tell you if you are sort of in the middle of that continuum that where you don't have uh, uh, optimal milk fat. So I wanted to show you some research data where we uh, uh, have looked at interaction of our diets with production level. So we have two experiments where we looked at interactions uh, with production level in fat supplements. So the first was during my master's with Mike Allen, where we had an experiment with uh, Energy Booster 100 and um, Megalac R. We sort of backed into that experiment because we had eight cannulated cows that were earlier in lactation. And we wanted 16 cows in the experiment. And the next eight cows I could get that no one else was using were lower producing later lactation cows. And that sort of led us into uh, uh, designing experiments where we actually go into the herd and pick cows that are high and low product producing. So this is an experiment from Penn State. Uh, I have to apologize, I didn't get this converted to, to uh, uh, pounds. Uh, the original file, of what my grad student has, and was hard to dig out quickly. Um, our treatments are control, Bergafat F100, so palmitic acid, and then calcium salts fed as megalac R. We picked this high producing group for 42 kilograms average during the experiment. Low producing cows are like 28 kilograms during the experiment. Um, same days in milk, same average days in milk. We went in and picked them based on, on milk yield. So we have, if we start out looking just at milk fat percent on the control diet, our high producing cows are at 3.1. Low producing cows are about a 3.8. Big difference, same barn, same diet, same management, 3.1 to a 3.8. Same, similar difference that we saw in our first experiment at Michigan State. The reviewers argued with me on this paper, and they said, you don't have high and low producing cows, you have high milk fat and low milk fat cows. And I said, look, I did not pick them on milk fat, I picked them on milk yield. I can't call them high and low milk fat because that's not what I selected them on. And I'm sure I could have got bigger difference if I selected them on milk fat, right? So uh, then our treatment effects, we, uh, the, the big thing to look at is the calcium salt. Decreased milk fat 
in high producing cows had no effect in the low producing cows. We saw the same thing at Michigan State that Megalac R decreased milk fat in the high producing cows, did not decrease fat in the low producing cows. Well, why is that? You know, with this production level question, quite often you get into arguments of what is that difference? And there's a couple options. One option is that it's dilution. Right? So when we simply plot uh, uh, milk yield by milk fat percent, you could say, well, it's just that those high producing cows are making more milk, they're diluting out that milk fat, right? Okay, that could be happening. I still think that's biologically relevant because milk fat, milk protein, and milk lactose synthesis are biologically coordinated. The systems usually go up and down in coordination, right? If for some reason you're stimulating lactose synthesis, but you're leaving milk fat synthesis behind, I think that's really interesting. And I think that's something to think about. Why are you disconnecting those two? Okay, so that's one option. You could have dilution effects. The other thing is that you may have differences in diet-induced milk fat depression. And we can see that very easily by measuring the alternate isomer. So in this experiment, we measured milk fatty acid profile, and this is trans-10, one of those fatty acids from the alternate pathway. High-producing cows really increased trans-10, so going from 0.5 to 2.3. Five-fold increase, right? Huge increase in trans-10. Low producing cows, absolutely no difference. So was there a difference in the rumen between these high and low producing cows? Definitely. These high producing cows shifted to alternate biohydrogenation when they had this additional unsaturated fat coming into the diet from calcium salt. Now you might be saying, I thought calcium salt's protected. Well, it's not protected within the rumen. It slows the release. Calcium salt slows the release of the unsaturated fat. It's much safer than feeding a free oil, but it's not protected. It still has a pretty high rumen availability. So what, what's going on in the rumen? Probably a lot of things. Probably part of this is driven by intake. Higher producing cows have higher intake. It's really hard to separate the effect of intake and production level uh, away from each other. So we had interest in looking at Alamet because our experience talking with field nutritionists was that there was quite a common observation that when people fed Alamet, they saw a milk fat response. And when we looked to the literature, no one had done a really good job of specifically investigating the effect of Alamet on milk fat. There's a lot of experiments with Alamet, but they weren't done in situations to actually tease out interactions. The good thing about milk fat depression is that we know some of the common risk factors and we can experimentally, uh, 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 in a very controlled manner, test those. So we set up an experiment where we had 16 high producing cows and 14 low producing cows. We fed them either Alamet or control, and then we put them through three dietary phases what we call a low risk phase, which is 33.5% NDF. And this is a pretty high forage NDF. I forget the forage NDF, but we, we don't feed any um, uh, high fiber byproducts. So, so this is a lot of forage fiber, pretty safe diet, and no added oil. And then we have a moderate risk diet, 31% NDF and 0.75% soybean oil. And then our high risk diet, which is 28.5% NDF and 1.5% soybean oil. I know you don't feed soybean oil raw in the diet, but this is a really easy way for me and a controlled way to increase uh, the concentration of really available unsaturated fat. It would be much harder for me to call up the mill and say, hey, send me a bad load of distiller grains, right? Very hard to control that. It's very easy for me to go get soybean oil from Sam's Club and dump it in, okay? So you pick high and low producing cows and you get high and low producing cows. Um, it was not set up to be a production experiment. We don't have a lot of power to look at milk yield, but we don't have any differences in milk yield. Our low producing cows are you know, starting about 60 pounds. They're giving up. These are later days in milk cows that we used. And then our high producing cows are somewhere around 90 pounds average during the experiment. The experiment was set up to look at milk fat, right? And we have these three dietary phases. So our low producing cows are on the left, 
high producing cows on the right. And then we're showing these dietary phases split by our, our uh, dotted lines here. So our low producing cows have higher milk fat than our high producing cows. That's what we had expected based on our previous experience. When we are in this low risk phase, there's no effect of aliment in low producing cows, no effect in the medium risk, no effect in the high risk. We go to our high producing cows, we see no effect in the low risk diet. But then when we start them on to the medium and the high risk diet, all of a sudden the controls start dropping off and the uh, Alamec cows maintain higher milk fat concentration. We see the same response in milk fat yield and uh, it's really explained by the trans 10 intermediate. So in our low producing cows, these are on the same scale. So it, the, the low producing cows do increase trans 10 when we go to the medium and the high, but they're increasing from like 0.5 up to like 0.8 or 0.9 versus our high producing cows are going from this 0.8 all the way up to 7% at the end of the experiment. But I but, uh, just wanted to point out the scales are, are the same. So our low producing cows, no change in the alternate intermediate during the low, moderate, or high risk phase. High producing cows, no change during the, the low risk phase. We go to the medium and the high risk phase, all of a sudden the control cows are skyrocketing in trans 10 concentration and the Alamec cows are maintaining much lower concentrations. This is 7% trans 10-18-1 in, in milk. That is extremely high. That, that is very, very high. That's, that's almost, you know, 9, 10% is the highest we can get them experimentally. So these cows are, are uh, having a massive difference at the end of this, this experiment. What really is striking to me is that if you think about it, if I did this experiment with low producing cows and how many uh, papers in research experiments are out there with low producing cows, a lot, right? So if I just did this with low producing cows, I would be standing here telling you Almet does nothing. If I did this with a safe diet, I would be standing here telling you Almet does nothing, okay? But if I did this with higher risk cows, so these high producing cows that are fed a riskier diet, I'm here to tell you Alamet does something, right? Now, I get frustrated with this, so I think I can appreciate how frustrated you are with this when you see data where something works here and doesn't work there, works here and doesn't work there, and then you say, what am I supposed to do? Well, I think the problem is, is that we are not doing a great job teasing out all of these dietary interactions when we test things, right? And that's sort of because we have limited number of cows, limited number of, of um, uh, stalls in the barn, we have limited numbers of grad students, grad students have limited numbers of hours in the day, we can only do so much, right? The advantage with milk fat is that we've done a lot of time course work and we know we do not need long feeding periods. If you have a problem, a diet problem that's going to cause milk fat depression, it's going to happen in seven to ten days, okay? So we're using that, that, that short response to our advantage and that allows us to test different diets and to try to tease out some of these interactions. And I think this is something we really, really need to start doing more of, is teasing out these diet by, uh, uh, diet interactions, diet by cow interactions. You know, there, there, there's a lot of neat examples in human nutrition where uh, the response is very dependent on your genetic type. So for example, there, there, when you look at calcium intake and risk of colon cancer, there's some people that absolutely does not make a difference. There's other people with just a single nucleotide polymorphism, one SNP, and if they have low calcium intake, their risk of colon cancer is like two and a half times normal, right? Do you think there's some differences in that, nutritional interactions with our cows by their genetic type? Probably. How do we figure that out? It's a hard question to answer. Uh, there's probably a lot more questions we can answer related to diet interactions and diet by, by cow physiology type, type interactions. 
Okay. So we next did the most dangerous thing a researcher can do and the most dangerous thing a grad student can do. My grad students are very, very trusting, I guess, because the same grad student, I said, okay, we need to come back and we need to replicate this and get more samples to understand the mechanism. So we came back with 22 Rimley cannulated cows fed alimentary control, and uh, we sort of replicated a similar thing. We have a low risk, moderate risk, and then a high risk. Low risk for seven days, this is also sort of a diet adjustment, getting aliment into the diet before we challenge them. We then have this 29% NDF, 0.75% soybean oil for 17 days. Not, not a really extreme diet. And then we just did two days of same NDF level by higher amount of oil. Again, you might think two days doesn't sound like much, but we're able to be able to see differences in the rumen biohydrogenation pathway in that very short challenge period. So um, milk yield, these cows were around 41 kilograms. We, we would have loved to be able to do with this with high and low producing cows, right? But you go into your herd and you try to find rumulate cannulate cows, you take what you can get. Uh, so I think this is reasonable production level uh, for cannulated cows for the experiment. Uh, no difference in milk yield uh, with our treatment. But we were able to replicate our milk fat response. So milk fat percent on the left, milk fat yield on the right. No difference in that day seven when we're on the, the regular diet. We go to our moderate risk diet. Our uh, Alamet cows maintain milk fat or control cows drop. Uh, same story with milk fat yield. So we're able to replicate our response. I was really happy about this, okay? Again, I appreciate how different those little things in the diet can be. You know, you're a different year, different corn silage, different cows. Can we replicate it? Well, we were able to replicate it. Uh, also replicated the increase in trans-10. Our, our control cows uh, increased trans-10 and our Alamet cows maintained lower trans-10 response. So we replicated the response and mechanistic data is coming. We're actually right now running the microbial profiles we have a lot of rumen samples to be able to characterize the change in the microbial population during this time period. So some key messages here. High producing cows are at the highest risk. Alamed appears to reduce the risk of milk fat depression in high producing cows while feeding high risk diets. And do you have some high producing cows in your herds? And do you have some low milk fat cows in that herd, even if a herd with a 3.8 milk fat? I'm sure you have some cows in there because of their feeding behavior, because of how they go about things, right? Those cows have small brains, but they have a couple billion neurons also, right? So whatever they're doing, there's some cows in that herd that are higher risk. Um, and the other thing is I think this can take some of the bumps out of the road so that that bad load of distiller grains, you know, that mixing air over the weekend, that it's sort of that extra insurance policy that you might be able to stabilize rumen fermentation and not fall into milk fat depression when those little uh, bumps in the road come along. So what's the mechanism? We don't know yet, but we hope to soon. It's definitely, there definitely is a rumen mechanism. Trans-10 is increasing. There's definitely something going on in the rumen. I cannot rule out a post-ruminal effect, but there's definitely something in the rumen. Probably through stabilizing rumen environment or altering rumen microbial population. Increasing microbial mass may be something that's going on. More microbes would be more machines to biohydrogenate, right? Uh, it also could be stabilizing certain populations that are really good at biohydrogenating using the normal pathway. We don't know yet. Okay, so here's where we're going to say, okay, we're changing subjects. Still talking about milk fat, but we're going to change topics a little bit. So one of the questions we've had interest in also is why are high corn silage diets at higher risk for milk fat depression? Hopefully I'm not the only one that sees it that way. It, tell me if I'm wrong. Are high corn silage diets harder to have high milk fat? I've always thought so. Why? Is it more rapidly fermented starch, you're feeding high moisture corn when you feed corn silage, right? Uh, lower effective fiber, is it differences in fiber digestibility rates? I, could be. 
But what about the 18-2? And you're probably saying, this guy's crazy. There's not much fat in corn silage, but you're feeding a lot of fat, right? So what about the level and rate of 18-2 availability? It's low in fat, cows are eating a lot of it, and you have high moisture corn, high moisture grain in that corn silage that's being very rapidly fermented. So when you go to the literature, there's very little published data on the fatty acid profile of corn silages. There's actually very little published on the fatty acid profile of corn grain. Uh, what we can find is that genetics is much more important than environment. So very different than fiber. Fiber is very different field to field, growing season to growing season. Uh, genetics is the predominant driver for corn fatty acid profile and fatty acid concentration. We did a plant part cutout. We wanted to know where's the fatty acid coming from. So we took the kernels, the cob, the stalk, the leaf, and looked at all those individually. In ni around 96% of the 18.1 and 18.2s in the corn kernel, okay? So that 18.2 that's in corn silage is very rapidly available. It's going to be digested and made available to the microbes quite rapidly. So we next went to some corn silage test plots. This is 2013 data. We're, we're just finishing up analyzing 2014 where we see sort of a similar distribution. So 18.2 is a percent of dry matter and there's a percent of fatty acids. If you just look at the 10th to the 90th, 0.9 to 1.6, is that a big difference? 0.5 percentage unit difference in 18.2? That's about as much as what I'm using in some of my situations to cause moderate risk for milk fat depression when I'm adding soybean oil, right? Uh, as a percent of fatty acids, 45 to 52. So this concentration on dry matter basis is profile plus fat concentration. Fat concentration is going from 2% to 3%. So 50% difference in fat concentration between those hybrids. Uh, corn grain plots. Uh, not as much variation, but 1.8 to, sorry, 10th is 1.8 to 90th is 2.2. Uh, 18.2 is percent of fatty acids is 55 to 60. Fatty acid concentration, 3.2 to 3.9. So not massive differences, and I'm not saying that this is going to solve every problem we've ever had on milk fat, but it's a contributor, right? And there's a reasonable amount of variation there. And maybe someday we'll be to the point where we would be able to select hybrids uh, based on milk fatty acid profile. And I think we could uh, select hybrids that we would expect to have a lower risk for diet-induced milk fat depression. And just to give a little bit of a scenario, it, uh, how much of an impact is this going to be? Well, it depends on how much corn silage you feed. So this is 30, 42, and 54% of the diet on a dry matter basis being corn silage. And then our 90th, our mean, and our, not, or our 10th mean and 90th percentile for that corn silage fatty acid profile, 18.2. So this is 60 to 90 grams per day difference in 18.2 intake just in the corn silage. What about the corn grain? Now you're gonna have more, right? Again, not saying it's gonna solve everything, but it's a contributor, and it's a reasonable contributor. All right, so now we're gonna to change topics once again. I, I, I'm really excited about corn silage data, so I, I wanted to, to, to show that. Uh, so we've become interested in daily patterns of intake and milk synthesis in the cow and how we can better manage the cow. So we call these daily patterns circadian rhythms. Circadian just means a 24-hour pattern. And I'm sure you appreciate daily rhythms. Uh, anyone who ever pulled an all-nighter in college or lived in the same household as a little baby <laughs> appreciates that. Or if you ever flew across the country or to Europe, uh, our bodies are built with a very strong daily pattern. Activity and alertness, nutrient metabolism, very well described in the literature. Intake, very well described. But what about milk synthesis? There's a little bit of literature out there. I think we all, as uh, people who have worked around cows, appreciate that there is a difference between morning and evening milking. But as researchers, we've really ignored that difference. So why is there this daily pattern? 
Well, there's a daily pattern because it allows the animal to anticipate changes and adapt before they, they occur. These daily patterns are conserved all the way from uh, uh, bacteria to humans, right? And the, uh, the, the organism needs to know what's coming. So, you know, lunch is in two hours. Your body knows lunch is in about two hours. And it's regulating what it's doing based on the knowledge that lunch is coming in two hours. It's not that it doesn't think it's ever going to eat again, right? And if you think if your body didn't know when lunch was coming, that it could be 10 days from now, it would need to be doing something very different than what it's doing when it knows lunch is coming in two hours. So it's very adaptive. It allows the animal to anticipate changes um, before they, they occur. So the key principles, I'm sure sort of giving away the punchline uh, before I show you any data. But our idea is that there is a daily circadian pattern of intake that has a major impact on the rumen. There's a daily pattern of milk synthesis. And we believe that maximizing efficiency requires synchrony of nutrient absorption and mammary needs. And now, I'm going to try to show you some of that data to, to convince you of those key principles. Just the, the theoretical figure of this, you have, a, say, a th theoretical rhythm of milk synthesis. So this is the capacity of the mammary gland to make milk going up and down over the day. And then you have a nutrient rhythm, which is coming from that daily pattern of nutrient intake. So I'm showing where these two rhythms are not in synchrony. And what would happen then is that at some time during the day you have lost potential because you have the capacity to make more milk than what you have nutrients to do. Another part of the day, you have more nutrients than what you have capacity to utilize them. Those nutrients are going to go to adipose tissue, right? So not saying our cows are not in synchrony. Hopefully the cow knows what she's doing and she's working this out. But my guess is there's probably certain things we do in managing the cow that don't allow her to synchronize. Are there examples where synchrony causes problem? You bet. When you look at the epidemiology data, night shift work is very bad for you, to say it simply. Anything you look at, from all the way from death rate, mortality, uh, morbidities, about any disease, all the way down to breast cancer, there are higher incidences in night shift workers than there are in day shift workers. <coughs> Obesity, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome are all higher in night shift workers. And you can replicate this in the mouse. Mice want to eat at night. If you force them to eat during the day, what will happen is they'll become insulin resistant and obese. And it is explained because the brain thinks it's one time a day based on the lights and the liver and adipose tissue think it's a different time of day because of the nutrient absorption cycle. So the synchrony within the animal uh, is, is really important. So when I got to Penn State, one of the first things we did was to build a feed observation system modeled after Mike Allen's system at Michigan State. We have these plastic feed tubs hanging from a load monitor, all wires into a computer, and we record feed weight every 10 seconds. And based on that, we can observe uh, feed intake across the day without going out and shoveling feed all the time and without disturbing the cow. So I wanted to show you some of these daily patterns to, to get you to appreciate how big of an impact this is. So this is just a control from one of our recent experiments um, showing dry matter intake the average intake in two-hour blocks and then starch intake, average intake in two-hour blocks. So overnight period, low dry matter intake, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 kilograms per hour. We feed here, and we, we take feed away uh, before we feed. We feed, and that's a big stimulus for intake, but then this afternoon period is also a really big stimulus for intake. So 1.5 to 2 kilograms per hour. So that's a fourfold difference in intake, right? Big difference in nutrient entry, entry into the rumen. So if we just take starch, we have about 0.15 kilograms per hour starch intake in the overnight. During the day, we're at five or 0.5, so you know, you're threefold higher starch intake during the day. So 
What has also sort of amazed me in thinking about how we think about nutrition is that we'll have really long arguments about a one percentage point difference in diet NDF and a one or two percent percentage point difference in diet starch intake, okay? And then we put this diet to the cow and then she eats a four-fold difference in that diet over time, okay? So at night, very four-fold lower starch intake during the day. What does that mean about how we balance diets, right? The, what's most important to the cow is what's entering the rumen, the amount of what's entering the rumen. And the amount of what's entering the rumen is dependent on the diet you balanced, but also how she's eating that diet, okay? We need to think of both of those. And I would argue that how she's eating it is having maybe a bigger impact at times than, than the balanced. Uh, in morning milking is uh, right before feeding. So they're being, they're milked right here at eight and then being fed. And then they're being milked again at six o'clock at night. Uh, there's a lot of interacting factors in feeding behaviors. So what's the impact of this daily pattern? Well, intake to me means entrance of fermentable organic matter into the rumen, food for the bugs, right? Fermentable organic matter means synthesis of VFAs and microbial proteins, so that's going to be dynamic over the day. VFAs mean acid load for the rumen, but they also mean nutrient supply to the cow. So in the same experiment, we did rumen evacuations three times, to representing three times over the day, not on the same day. And so this gives us actual pool size. So dry matter pool size, 14 and a half kilograms down to 12 kilograms before feeding, back up over 15 kilograms uh, before evening milking. Rumen starch pool size, 0.6 kilograms down to 0.3 kilograms up to one kilogram. So three-fold difference in ruminal starch pool size. That's massive, isn't it? Really, really big difference in the rumen environment. Huge difference. So we said that you have the starch entering the rumen, you're making VFAs, you're dropping pH. Do we see that? Well, yeah, we know. We always have seen this in, in data. We have highest pH before feeding. We feed, they eat a lot of feed, it drops. So you're going from a 6-2 average down to a 5-8 average, and this is average across all cows, right? You go into the evening period and cows stop eating and they start ruminating more. That's the other thing to remember. A cow can't eat, ruminate at the same time, right? So during the day when she's eating so much, she's not ruminating as much. At night, she's not eating as much. She's ruminating a ton. Her rumen pH starts increasing again, comes back up before, before feeding. So really big difference in rumen environment because of rumen pH also. I mentioned that I think we all appreciate there's a difference between morning and evening milking, but we really have ignored this as, as researchers. Very few reports of bi-milking data. So in 2008, a Wisconsin group looked at um, uh, milk in, I think, five herds milking twice a day. You have about a one kilogram higher milk yield at the morning evening than in the evening milking. This is over five days. But you had 0.5 percentage units lower milk fat at the morning milking than at the evening milking. Is that dilution? It, it could be part of it, but it, I don't think it's explaining all of it. Is this a repeating pattern? Is it happening every day? You bet. Do you see this on your herds? Yeah. I mean, I hear, I hear of large herds that are shipping if they can fill a tanker with one milking, they'll ship their morning tanker to a different plant than their evening milking based on who's paying more for milk fat. So we had an, a question on what's the interaction of timing of intake and timing of milk synthesis. So to answer this, we fed cows one time a day in the morning, or we fed cows four times a day in equal feeding. So we're sort of forcing that cow to eat, eat equally over the day. And then we milked her four times a day because I was a new professor and needed to torture my grad students, right? Uh, we saw highest milk yield at the first milking of the day, decreased over the day, the morning milking cows, or more, the one time a day fed cows, increased again at this evening milking. 
What was more striking is milk fat concentration. So in our four time a day fed cows, they were higher milk fat concentration in all milkings, about a 0.25 percentage unit higher milk fat concentration. Same diet, same barn, just a different way of feeding it. But there's a daily pattern. There's a daily pattern in four, the one time a day fed cows and four times a day fed. If you look at the amplitude of the difference, you had about a 50% reduction in the amplitude when we fed four times a day compared to when we fed one time per day. So my interpretation of this is that there is a daily pattern to the mammary's gland's ability to make milk fat but there's also an impact of the timing of nutrient availability that's playing in here, okay? So I think we're probably having an impact of both, but very striking the effect we can have just by how we manage that diet. So the summary, milk and milk components were altered only by changing the feeding uh, strategy Four times they increased milk fat but did not eliminate the circadian pattern, uh, therefore, you have this daily pattern that's dependent on the timing of nutrient intake. How can we use this information? Well, I like to call this a circadian feeding strategy. And the idea is just to keep in mind what that cow is doing and how she's consuming that diet that's your balancing. And what I wonder is if we can match the timing of delivery and diet composition to the temple requirements of both the rumen and to the cow. So, First, you have to think of the rumen. Can we stabilize the amount of fermentable organic matter entering the rumen over the day? I think we can. Would that be of an, of an advantage? I think it would, but we, we still need to do some more work to do that. So feeding a single TMR does not provide this since there are high and low intake periods of the day, right? Uh, and that's creating really huge dynamics in, in nutrient entry. So we can complement the timing of management activity. So feed delivery is a very strong stimulus uh, for, feed, for feed intake. University of British Columbia data is very, very convincing in that. Cows come to the feed bunk when you deliver fresh feed. Pushing up feed is not as good. If feed's not within reach, it helps, but it's, you, it's hard to trick cows into uh, um, to thinking that it's fresh feed. Feeding fresh feed is very strong stimulus. So uh, I think it can be used to increase intake during low intake periods of the day. So one of the recommendations I've had, and I have to say I have not tried to get data to show this, but I think it's something interesting to think about, is that you need to have feed available when cows return from the milking parlor because you want them to eat, right? And I think they're probably going to eat anyway if it's all new fresh feed there or not. But what I would actually prefer to do is to use that stimulus, stimulus of feeding, delivery of fresh feed, to increase intake in a period of time when cows are not going to, in, not going to eat normally. So if you think about maybe two to three hours before or after milking, and as times when those cows are normally back laying down, resting, very low intake period of the day, maybe if we offered fresh feed during those times, we can draw those cows back up to the feed bunk and get some of the uh, feed intake spread across a little bit more of the day. I have to warn that we've done some research with feeding at night, and we, our problem is, is that it's really hard to make cows eat during the overnight period. When you feed cows at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, what they do is they eat a massive amount of feed and then they go to sleep and they end up slug feeding. Okay? So it's a little bit hard to push cows way outside of their normal. Uh, you want to be careful with changing these feeding times that you're not uh, uh, causing slug feeding but I think you can use feed delivery time as a management tool. So the other thing we started working with is feeding different diets over the day. So we're sort of all in this mindset that we make a TMR and we feed that same diet across the whole day. But cows are not eating the same amount of that diet across the whole day, right? So why does it have to be the same diet? We've done a lot of work with uh, feeding low fiber diets and high fiber diets at different times a day. I think there's a lot of potential there to feed a diet with nu the nutrient compositions matched to this timing of intake, but we don't have uh, all the answers there yet. 
mostly because you have to consider the effect you have on feeding behavior, and, and that's a big confounding factor. You have to watch the cows when you, you uh, make these changes. So just to overview, you know, a lot of things are going into this daily rhythm. Uh, you have the light dark cycle, milking times, feeding times. They're all having an impact on the daily pattern of intake and uh, the daily pattern of milk synthesis. Okay. So to wrap up, I wanted to just go through some uh, practical recommendations that I have in trying to increase milk fat. So to me, okay, when milk fat is acceptable, I think you want to look for including more risk factors that can make you more milk, make, you, make uh, cows more feed efficient. When milk fat's low, look for a reason. Seven to 10 days is about what it takes for milk fat depression to happen. Is there a certain string or group of cows, those highs producing cows are more susceptible? What season is it to set that goal? And then also is the sample a daily average? What in my approach is that it's a really an experiment in progress. You have to let the cows tell you when you fix the problem. Uh, the first thing I like to recommend, that, recommend is pull out as much unsaturated fat as you can. The concentration and source is really important. Again, calcium salts are more slowly released, but they're not 100% protected. Uh, and I think it's the best first step because I think you're not going to lose much milk or you're not, you don't have a big risk of losing milk doing this, at least in the short term. Monitor milk yield and milk fat over time. See if you fix your problem. Diet fermentability, experience with diets in your area is essential. Uh, start basically increasing fiber, decrease fermentability, monitor milk yield over time because you're taking a big risk when you start decreasing fermentability that you're going to start to lose milk. But you know, there's times where you decrease fermentability, you might actually gain some milk if you have a reasonable amount of subacute acidosis going on. Rumen modifiers, rumensin's a risk factor, but it's not going to in itself cause milk fat depression. Yeast and direct fed microbials, I think there's some good reasons to think they'd be helpful, but I don't think we've done the experiments the right way. I think there's some nice data showing that DCAD, increasing DCAD, will uh, decrease the risk for milk fat depression. I haven't waded into the sodium versus potassium argument. I think that question is still, still out there. And we've shown you data that Alamet uh, reduces the risk. But remember, you're dealing with, with many interactions. Feeding strategies, number of feeding times per day, slick bunk before feeding. I think that's a really risky one because those cows are hungry. They're going to be really aggressive and they're going to slug eat when they come back. Number of feeding times. Remember, you can slug feed a TMR. And then the last thing that I, that I haven't mentioned is saturated fat supplements. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, some data out there that, that high palmitic supplements can get you a little bit of milk fat. I think the wrong time to use them is when you have low milk fat because I don't think you're going to get as much good out of them because the mammary gland does not have all of its ability to utilize that, that fat. So to conclude, milk fat depression is caused by many, many interactions, both nutrition and management. Alimet reduces the risk. Uh, time of intake is, uh, has a large impact on rumen and milk synthesis. And you may be able to change feeding times and feed multiple diets over the day. And again, it's a constant experiment in progress. We need to let the cows tell us when we're doing things right and when we're doing things wrong. If milk fat's low, we're doing something wrong. Uh, just to quickly mention uh, uh, the, the folks that do the hard work. Uh, I continue to collaborate on some of the more basic things with Dale Bauman at, at Cornell. Um, and we've had support from USDA and a number of, of companies, including uh, Novus. We recently had a USDA grant funded to continue our work in the circadian area. Thank you, and if we have time for questions, happy to take them. When was 3.5 set up for the butterfly? I don't know. So how do you know you're depressed? The, so, so you want to know when is, what is milk fat depression? The age-old question, okay? So my answer is you have milk fat depression when milk fat is below your goal. That's because everyone has a different goal. That, that, that's one of the answers. The, 
more scientific answer would be when milk fat's below the genetic potential of the cow. But we don't really know what the genetic potential of the cow is exactly, right? Obviously, cows are able to make more milk fat than, than 3.5, right? So 3.5 is below the genetic potential. But I, uh, I think we would also have to say, you know, what season of the year is it? Because it's very repeatable, 0.25% difference across the year. So I, um, I sort of would like to break out of the idea of having a set herd average as, our, as uh, when we're, we have milk fat depression when we don't. Um, I would like us to start looking at groups within the herd to make sure that, that we don't have some cows that are really high and some cows are really low and we're averaging out to something that doesn't seem like a problem, but we could do better. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. but I think, I think 3.5 was set up in the 60s sometime, in the 50s. Am I correct or am I close? I Okay, so we were making 50 pounds of milk in the 50s. Now we're making 90 pounds of milk and we still want the 3.5. Yeah. Is the cow hurt? Is the cow hurting under 3.5? Well, so, you know, that, that's a great, great question of what the goal should be. Um, and uh, depending on the, what you are trying to do with that cow, I think that when you're, in the, you're breeding that cow, if she is a 3.0 milk fat, uh, I might not be so worried about that because she has extra energy and I would probably get an advantage in reproductive efficiency. Now what I do not want is for her to have a 3.0 milk fat because she has low rumen pH and low fiber digestibility and subcute rumen elastidosis, right? That's bad. But there's a lot of different situations and that's the other thing to be careful about is that I think over time we, we got used to when we fed high grain diets in the 80s especially, we always associated low milk fat with acidosis. It's not necessarily so. Low milk fat can come from acidosis, but I think more commonly today we have uh, low milk fat because of high unsaturated fatty acids playing a key role. Um, when looking at the fatty acid profiles on the corn silage, did you look at differences between BMRs and conventional silage, or was that just all one we, group of 60 some samples? There, there were BMR samples uh, in the test plots. So this is the Pennsylvania Professional Dairy Manager Sponsors test plots. Uh, there were some BMRs in there. Um, I had quickly looked at it, and there was not any striking difference between the BMRs and the others, but I, I don't recall the, the specific. Yeah. Uh, kind of along the same lines, you showed the amount of fat coming from corn grain. As we go into these high corn silage diets and we continue to process the grain finer and finer, are we not adding the risk factor to milk fat production? I, uh, you know, I, I think we, we want to process because we want to get the starch utilization, right? But I think what would be to our advantage would be to complement that by selecting the right hybrids that would um, marginally at least decrease our risk in those situations. And, and the, the other thing to mention there, I, I have an agronomist that, that runs the test plots that we collaborate with on, on this, and he said, well, you have to be careful. You would not want to breed for minimal uh, corn, milk, corn fat because you're going to hurt germination. Because remember, the seed is using that as an energy source, right? Uh, so you would not want to minimize that. But through a combination of selecting profile and selecting for slightly lower fat concentrations, I think we would have a corn that would better match how we feed cows. Now, convincing the corn uh, genetics industry of that, I've not been successful with. 